As people are still making their way in, and over the next few minutes, I would also ask that you who are here, you would take this opportunity to begin to tune your heart and mind to, uh, to what God will speak to you today. Joanne Heater will be uh, playing, and uh, I just pray that this will be a time where you're saying, okay, God, I'm here. I want to hear from you. What do you have to say? Be asking him that. Joanne? Thank you. If you are a visitor with us today, we thank you so much for choosing to spend this time with us. We don't believe that you're here by accident, but somehow God has directed your path here. And we'd love to connect, at least to know who you are and give you an introduction to 4C Bible Church. An easy way for you to let us to know who you are is through our bulletin. We have a welcome card in there, and if you could just take a few moments to fill it out and then tear it off along the perforation, a little later in the service, when the offering plate comes by, just place the card into the offering plate. That'll be your introduction to us. And our introduction to you, we have a, a brochure that tells you about 4C Bible Church, and as the ushers make their way back up the aisle, 
If you could just wave at them enough to get their attention, and they'd be glad to pass that to you. Thank you very much. Also, a reminder, of course, for all of us that if you have a cell phone or electronic device that might be making noise, please reach into your purses, pockets, wherever it is, and silence it right now so that it does not distract from our worship. We would appreciate that very much. I hope that as you have come here today that you have been asking God to turn your heart and your mind to him and to speak to, to you in whatever it is that he has to say to you. And that he would give you the, the ears and the heart willing to hear and willing to obey. But in the, right now, I'd like us to join together in telling him how much we love him. Will you join me in uh, our time of worship? Please stand.
Father, knowing you and walking through life with you is our greatest joy. We know that you love us and that we can trust you to direct us in whatever path you have planned for us that brings glory to yourself and, and your good to us. All of this through your grace. We thank you, Father. Please make us part of your plan to change the world, one person at a time. Oh, Father, please make us faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
about 23 years ago, I was invited to join a Christian ministry, a Christian choral music ministry called the Alleluias. Some of you may have heard of them. They're based in Ellicott City, Maryland. And uh, it was a perfect match for me because in that ministry I was able to use my uh, spiritual gift of teaching and I was able to use my skill as a rehearsal pianist and accompanist and piano soloist. And um, I also got to use some of my electrical engineering skills because I became the maintainer and uh, caretaker of their electronic sound system. And I served in that ministry for 14 years, uh, which was a wonderful time and a wonderful experience. One of the members of that choral group uh, asked me once if I ever thought of moving on to a different ministry, and I remember telling her, Carrie, um, it would take an act of God to get me out of this ministry. <laughs> and then one day, God acted. Uh, I was invited to a luncheon up here at Longgate uh, Shopping Center at a restaurant there, and uh, they told me that they had decided to replace me with someone else who had already been hired, and um, in about three minutes, I was out of a job that I had held for 14 years, something I would never have done on my own, but God had something in store for me. He was moving me out of my comfort zone. I was very comfortable serving in that ministry, and he moved me way out of my comfort zone by, um, within a few months, um, moving me into the role as uh, chairman of the board of directors at the Laurel Pregnancy Center, where he had planned for me to take them through a major transition of personnel and of becoming a medical center and a number of other things that were really not things that I thought I could do, but God had equipped me to do. And his call there was unmistakable difficult. Uh, anyway, I challenge you, if you are comfortable, as I was, and as we all tend to be, if God is moving you, listen up. Uh, it's a whole lot better to do what he wants you to do than to stay comfortable in what you would like to do yourself. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you humbly, beseeching you to hear our prayers knowing that you've promised that you will and that you do. Uh, you are mighty. You led your people out of Egypt with a, a strong arm and a mighty hand, and you have been trustworthy to keep your promises. So we come before you expecting you to answer and to glorify your name. Uh, I pray this morning for Paul Adams, who is going to minister to us through the word, I pray, Lord, that your word in Paul's lips would affect our hearts. I lift up those who are recovering from illness or surgery, Emily Wirtz, Susan Remy, Mona McCammon, Pat Sims, Betty Wilmore, and for those who are dealing with cancer, Sue Moraz, Art Kennedy, Tom Bean, Ruth Scheib, Joanne Chang. Um, I pray for Greg Schaefer, who is recovering from bypass surgery, and for Celinda Messenger, who is recovering from rotator cuff surgery, that in, in her case in particular, you would help her manage the pain and um, the immo immobilization of her arm, and that she would be able to continue to uh, serve you uh, as she recovers. I pray for Linnea Tinker, who is having pain also uh, and is awaiting the results of a skin biopsy. I lift up uh, my friend Doug Kelly, who on Tuesday afternoon will have hip replacement, replacement surgery. Lord, I pray that that will go smoothly and that the recovery will be rapid. I pray, Lord, for a 4 day camp and the campers who are here, that you would draw them to faith in Jesus Christ, draw them close to Jesus, help them understand the, the gospel, help them understand who Jesus is, why he had to die, 
and that he died for them personally. I lift up the boys' camps at Camp Henlock, in particular the father-son uh, activities that are going on these next few days. I pray, Lord, that you will use that to, to draw together the fathers and the sons as you draw them together with you, yourself. I pray that that fellowship would be sweet and deep. Uh, I lift up our ministry leaders as uh, they are planning for the, this next year of service to you. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to focus on our mission of, of uh, discipling others and evangelizing those who aren't already disciples. I pray, Lord, that each ministry would focus on those goals. I lift up Katie Smith in Asia. I pray, Lord, that she would be kept in good health and that you would encourage her as she ministers faithfully in your name. I lift up Michael and Lupe Geis and the upcoming outreach that they are planning. I lift up before you Carol Schlorf and her roommate's mother, Irina, who needs to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would draw her to faith and bless her with your grace. And I pray for Cullen and Janet Rast. Lord, as Janet's condition continues to deteriorate, I pray for Cullen as the caregiver that you would strengthen and encourage him and that uh, his ministry in your name would continue as it always has. Lord, as, as we close our prayer, I just thank you for sending Jesus to die for me that I might know you and worship you and serve you and love you. And I pray that each of us would focus on you and your glory to the praise of the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.
Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Timothy Mallet, and um, I'm going to be sharing my testimony. I've, um, I've been going to Four Seas since I was a little kid, and I've grown up at this church and learned a lot of what I know about God from here. I, um, when, when I had the opportunity to apply to Mission Possible, I thought it would be just a lot of fun. Um, I had no idea how it would change my life. And I'm, I'm so glad I was accepted to be part of the teams that go out and just preach the gospel and learn, were learned how to, or taught how to preach the gospel. In MP1, we were taught um, how to preach the gospel and how to share um, Christ with others. And on MP1, I also, I truly um, came to understand what it meant to be a Christian. Being raised in a Christian home and growing up at Forsey, I was following in what I had been taught. It was during phase one of MP1 that I committed my life and God realized, and God showed me that being a Christian is more than just going to church and believing what my parents believed. It is actually a personal relationship with God who loved me and died on the cross for me. It became my own faith, not just my faith of the church or my faith that my parents had. In MP2, he, um, I had grown um, to know and, sh- um, or in MP2, um, I, I reached um, a point where I'd grown to know just how important it is to spend time with the Lord. MP2 helped me to see the importance of spending time reading my Bible, and I am still learning this. During MP2, we got to um, get deeper in our devotions, and that helped me to grow in my personal walk with the Lord as well. It was here that I learned how um, to get more from my devotions and to spend more time in prayer. God was working in my life um, to help me see how important it is to share the gospel as well. In MP2, our team went to San Francisco And many people there were just anti-God, and they didn't want anything to do with him. And it just really showed me um, and helped me realize just how much, as Christians, we need to be sharing Christ with others. During MP3, things changed a little bit. We were stepping out of our comfort zone and to share Christ with um, people from Guatemala and of Costa Rica. We didn't know what to expect, but we were excited about this new experience. The people in, this, um, in these countries made sharing um, the gospel and sharing Christ easy as they were welcoming and very comforting and they just wanted to hear what we had to say, you know? And um, they, um, one, of, one of the things God taught me during phase three is how important it is to fellowship with other believers. We were so busy during phase three that it was um, hard to spend a lot of time in our group devotions. The, the last two week, or the last couple of weeks of MP3 became a little less busy, and we got to fellowship as a team more in God's word. I was encouraged by other team members in how God was working in their, in their life. I really liked being able to spend more time just talking about God's word with people on our team and fellowshipping. God used this to deepen um, my own personal devotions and deepen my walk with him. MP3 helped me to really see that other believers and fellowshipping with other believers can just help you walk with the Lord and keep you on track spiritually. I've learned so much during this past three years of Mission Possible. I know what it truly means to be a follower of Christ. I see how important it is to share the gospel with the world and to stay in fellowship with other believers. I would like to personally thank you for the ways that you've supported Mission Possible. Um, MP has helped teach me what it means to be a man of God. As a church, we need to keep supporting Mission Possible. We need to keep giving our money to the ministry because it's, it's helping to turn regular teenagers into truly committed believers in Christ. God has, used this, um, God has used the things that I have learned from MP to give me a heart for missions and for sharing the gospel with the people I come in contact with. 
I'm so grateful that I could be a part of the Mission Possible and be on, um, have the privilege of going on all three phases. Thank you. This is what we take with us on Mission Possible as a tool to preach the gospel. And that's all that it is, is a, is a tool to communicate the gospel. Thanks very much, Tim. I enjoyed your testimony of faith, and I've seen that happen year after year in the lives of teenagers. As we've said, let's go and become fishers of men. That's what Jesus said. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Discipleship is not something that happens simply in a classroom. That's why Jesus said, follow me. He took with him his disciples and he showed them what it was like to be a disciple. Do we need classrooms? Absolutely. But if it just stays in the classroom, it's just theoretical and it means absolutely nothing. We need to be out experiencing the faith. I remember as a young believer, I came to this church, I was a mess. <laughs> my hair was hanging down on my shoulders. I was wearing a black leather jacket and I was rough around the edges. And uh, I thought these people are gonna judge me. And I came in here and Pastor Small said, Paul, I've heard about you and I just want you to know we care about you we're praying for you. And that just melted my heart. I thought, who's judging who? And uh, I was excited about what the Bible said. I was reading the Bible, having been convicted. And I remember sitting back there in the back after a night of, of drinking and getting in trouble and listening to Pastor Small preach from Romans chapter 6 talking about people being slaves to sin. And I thought, that's me. I'm a slave. And it was like the whole room disappeared and it was just me and God. And I walked out of this church under conviction and uh, kept reading the scriptures and quite frankly, I wasn't feeling too good about myself because I had the weight of conviction upon me from God. He was showing me how undone and how unrighteous I really was. And finally I called upon his name and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, that happened and I didn't stop going to bars at first. <laughs> um, I would go into bars and be talking to girls and telling them about Jesus. <laughs> and uh, I remember one day the Lord said to me, and this was only a couple weeks time, by the way, choose you this day who you're going to serve. And so I walked out of that bar and never to go back to drinking and doing drugs and all those things again. And I could not stop telling people about Jesus. If you saw me, you were going to hear about Jesus. It didn't matter the context or what. In fact, I was probably preaching when I shouldn't have been <laughs> in certain situations. But the Lord was gracious to me and merciful to me as a young believer, and he used me, even though I might have offended some people with my manner. Excited? 
and wanting them all to know about Jesus. So my heart was, was right. I wanted them to know who Jesus Christ was. And so um, I wanted to go into Agape Fellowship. That was the singles ministry at that time. And because of circumstances in my life, I was told, you know, you can't go into that ministry. And I was absolutely um, happy that God was showing me his direction, believe it or not, even though he was saying no to me. I just wanted to be where God wanted me to be. And so Ron Jones started calling me up and saying, can you share your testimony with the teens? Can you play guitar with the teens and, and different things like that? And so I started going to the youth group and it gave me uh, um, a platform to minister to others, although I wasn't thinking of it in that way at that time. And so I was just sharing my testimony, sharing what Jesus did in my life, and uh, playing the guitar and loving every minute of it. And uh, on the 4th of July, after my sister pointed her finger at me and said, you're an evangelist, don't stop preaching the gospel. I heard about EE e. going down to um, the mall, the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And so I went down with Gary Williams, and we're on the mall. There's millions of people. And uh, we run into um, Matt Harvey interning with Open Air Campaigners for the summer. He's a member of our church. He was a teenager at the time. And they said, we need some help. Would you, uh, is there anybody you can send with us? And I said, I'll go with you. So I went with them. And uh, I remember this guy, Joe Toy, preaching in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And all these teenagers that were sitting out there, and they looked like I uh, used to look. <laughs> and uh, they came up around the sketchboard, and they grabbed the paintbrush out of Joe's hand. And, Joe just said, just pre kept preaching, and when he got to the point he needed the paintbrush, he grabbed the paintbrush, and he said, excuse me, I need that paintbrush. The guy gave it back to him. I was like, wow, this is pretty neat. And so uh, uh, he finished the message, and afterwards I'm standing there like this, and these guys come up and they said, you're with him? Why do you have tattoos on you? You're a Christian, and all this, and... So I shared the gospel, and I was thinking, I want to do this the rest of my life. This is great. This is awesome. I want to be out sharing the gospel. And so when Matt Harvey came home from his internship, I found him, and I said, teach me how to use the sketchboard. And so he taught me, and my first sketch, he goes, that looks terrible. <laughs> Real encouraging. Anyway, so... Uh, we, we went to Ron Jones and we said, Ron, we want to go to Ocean City and preach. And he's like, all right. He said, there's this program called Mission Possible. It's kind of died out. We can go under the auspices of Mission Possible. Let's go. So Ron, not an evangelist, a pastor, but willing to share his faith, took us down to Ocean City, a bunch of us, Zeke Wharton, Dave Drawn, Matt Harvey, a bunch of young guys, and me. I was the old guy. I was 27 or something, 28. I don't know. And uh, so Matt preached pretty much that whole week, 17 years old. He's preaching big crowds on the boardwalk. I'm like, wow. And he says, Paul, it's your turn. <laughs> so uh, I got up there, and uh, I have to say, my knees were feeling weak. <laughs> And uh, I forgot the message, and uh, I gave my testimony, which was fine. And uh, when I was done, I told Matt, I said, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not cut out for preaching. I'm, I should just talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's what God is calling me to do. Anyways, I got up the courage to use the sketchboard again, and here we are. I guess it's 25 years later. I'm still using the sketchboard, still preaching. 
I'm the most unlikely person to be called to preach the gospel. I was afraid to... uh, I was nervous about talking to people when I was younger, and I used to drink to have the courage to even talk to a girl. So, But now God has me up preaching publicly in front of people. I graduated last in my high school class, and that's not because of a lack of being able to learn. It's just that I was skipping school and hanging out with the wrong crowd. And so it was a real privilege to me after becoming a believer that Enforcee helped me with this financially to go to Washington Bible College and to go back to school and actually accomplish graduating from an institution. It took me a long time, of course, because I had a family, a full-time job, and preaching also. but. That was helping me in my discipleship, too. And and what I like about how God forced me to go to Bible college, I think it took 13 years. I took off a year when I was married and took off a year um, when I joined OAC because that was their policy, Um, is that as I went to classroom and I'd go out on the street, I was able to use what I was learning right away on the street in an experiential way. And so I think that I was taught both in the classroom and in the street. And I think that that's how we always should be taught. There always has to be an experiential element to what we're doing. So I've been walking with the Lord now. Uh, 25 years. He's been faithful to me. I've come a long way um, by his mercy and by his grace. Uh, There's nothing more that that I'd rather do than preach the gospel. Nothing else. Some of my greatest memories are being out with teenagers on the street, watching them experience Jesus Christ in their lives. Having been in this church and and learned from Sunday school, faithful Sunday school teachers, but they needed to see that the faith was real and be out experiencing the faith instead of just hearing about Bible stories and doctrine and things like this, which are absolutely important and I'm an advocate of. And so I think Mission Possible should be not just for teenagers. I think it should be for the whole church. I think everyone should be a disciple. In fact, there's not two classes of Christians. And with that, I want to pray and get started. Let's pray. Lord, We thank you this morning for the power of the gospel. It transforms lives. There's no greater message that's ever been given among men. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace towards sinners from every walk of life, from every uh, race of people, from every ethnicity. You are calling people to yourself, and they are becoming like your son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray this morning we be gripped with the urgency to go and make disciples. Lord, we pray that we be challenged in our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would be the object of our affections above all things in this world, above all people in this world. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come and convict our hearts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And uh, Lord, we pray that we would have repentant hearts in areas that we need to change. Lord, we also pray that we would be encouraged by your word, that you're going to finish the work that you started in us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. 
So there are not two classes of Christians. All believers are disciples. Acts 6, 1 and 2 says this, Now in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Notice that all the believers are characterized as disciples. There are not two classes of Christians. This has um, crept into the American church for a lot of years, that you can be a believer and not a disciple. This is not biblical teaching. Also, um, Christians are characterized as a whole, as disciples in Acts 6-7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So when a person believes, they become a disciple. Well, what is a disciple? Well, it's not someone who simply attends church services or maybe a church activity once a week. I mean, they may do that, but that's not simply what it is. It's not simply coming and learning doctrine, which we are very good at in this church. Most of us know doctrine, and I hope we never slip away from that discipline of learning the scriptures and knowing doctrine. Because we have nothing to preach if we don't know it, right? Over and over again throughout this summer in Mission Possible, the teens said, in order for us to preach the gospel, we have to know the word of God, right? And so a disciple is not someone who just learns doctrine. Jesus was angry with people who just knew the word of God but didn't practice the word of God, religious Pharisees, right? So what are disciples? Well, Baker's Encyclopedia defines a disciple as someone who follows another person or another way of life and submits himself to that discipline. And so it's actually following a person being dedicated to their teachings, but following their way of life. Their way of life. I remember as a young Christian thinking, everywhere I go, I got to represent Jesus. If I go to the gas station, the grocery store, wherever it is, and that still continues today, I have to represent Jesus, right? It's a way of life. I mean, People who believe in Christian science, they follow the way of Mary Eddie Baker. Buddhists follow the way of Buddha. Muslims, Muhammad. The Moonies, Sun Young Moon. The Mormons, the general authorities. Evolutionists follow Darwin, right? And other leading teachers. Masons follow the Messianic order. Je Jehovah's Witnesses follow the the teachings of their leaders, and we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. His way, his life, that's the way we go. The word disciple is found in the, in the New Testament about 269 times. The word Christian is only found three times. And when Christian is used, it's referring to disciples. A Christian is one who is Christ-like, right? One who follows Christ. And so, being a Christian being a, is to be a disciple. Okay, well, all Christians are disciples, and all Christians count the cost of what it is in order to be a disciple. I remember when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, things in the Middle East flared up. I remember a fellow Marine saying, I did not sign up for this. 
Um, now, I, I was thinking at the time, well, I came in the Marine Corps to straighten out my life. I could actually be in war. This could be happening. I could go to war. And so, thankfully, I made it through boot camp and, you know, became a Marine. But he said, I didn't sign up for this. He hadn't counted the cost. He had gone in for many reasons, but it wasn't for the reason of going to combat. People say they're Christians or join churches for many reasons, but are they in the battle, so to speak? Are they walking out into life with the armor of God on? Engaging this world with the gospel? It's the same thing. Christians count the cost. A guy named Hans Klobben said this, as we should expect, whenever the New Testament explains discipleship, it immediately warns us of the cost. Being a follower of Jesus splits up your family, threatens your life, and calls you to radical sacrifice of your job, finances, desires, hopes, and reputation. Have you ever thought of your Christian faith in those terms? Jesus said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all those who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and he is not able to finish. I've seen over the years many people profess faith in Christ only to fall away. I've seen teenagers stand on this stage and profess their experience with Jesus Christ on even Mission Possible and see them later deny the faith. Even those that were on teams that I led. That's heartbreaking. But you see, a lot of Christians don't count the cost. When it comes down to it, something else takes them away from the faith. Now, I've seen a lot of them go on to be on the mission field, to be uh, advocates for missions, because not everybody can actually go to another country, another place, right? You have to have people that send them. <laughs> I'm on the mission field because I have been sent by people who support us in the mission. Not just, I'm not talking about just in prayer. I mean, um, financially, I'm talking about prayer and the support of this local body. I would not still be on the field if it was not for the support and the prayers of this local body. We're all in it together. We're all in it together. But that does not, if you give, look, I'm not excused from giving because I'm on the front lines preaching. I still give, but I primarily am on the front lines. If you're giving and God has gifted you that way, you're not excused from sharing the gospel. You must share the gospel in your place of influence in life. If you're not, you're not obeying Jesus Christ. You need to find a vehicle to share the gospel in your life. You say, well, my job won't allow me. I have to work. Well, you need to find an outside opportunity then to share the gospel, because all people share the gospel who belong to Jesus Christ. So, I got off topic. But it's true. It's true. You must count the cost. And one of the costs is going out and sharing the gospel and getting rejected for the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another cost is if anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife, his children, his brothers and sisters, 
Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. There can be no, no human relationship in our lives that is above the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't literally mean we're to hate our loved ones, right? Jesus said we're characterized by love. But it means that our love for God should be so great that our relationship with others is almost like hate. Okay? And so Jesus is number one, not... He's all. He's everything. I see my wife, my kids, my family through the prism of Jesus Christ. Everything in our lives is through him. And so a disciple counts the cost because you will be hated by this world. If you were of the world, the world would love you. Right? It would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. You know, we live in the United States. We're not ha losing our heads for Jesus Christ. I remember being arrested at Delaware University preaching the gospel. Um, the police snapped the handcuffs on me while I was preaching. Put me in the prison, the holding tank, I should call it. And I was thinking, this is nothing. People are losing their heads in this world for the gospel. I was out in, what, 10 minutes? Something like that. And yet, with, with that kind of freedom, we, don't, we fail to preach the gospel. Just this last semester at uh, UMBC, I was preaching using the sketchboard. And uh, the topic of homosexuality came up. They, the question was, well, what about homosexuality? Is that, does God accept that? Is that okay? And so, I have to be faithful to the scriptures, right? You have to be faithful to the scriptures. And so I said, any sexual out activity outside of God's plan for marriage, one man and one woman, is sinful. Fornication, homosexuality, anything, that's outside of God's plan for marriage. Well, I was called a homophobe and all kinds of words I can't say here on the stage. Um, I was told that I hate people. And uh, a girl screaming at me, and she said, why do you hate so much? And she, her face is red and angry. And she throws a, a, a cup of lemonade on me while, while I'm preaching. And so, um, <laughs> it was kind of shocking. Um, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect that when I went out uh, that day to preach. But I had been praying, Lord, help me respond to people with love, no matter what happens. Because, you know, in a second, uh, a person can get in the flesh. So I had to pray, Lord, help me to always show love. Help me with this. And so she threw the lemonade on me. The authorities came. Um, a guy tried to defend me because another guy started cursing me out that was a homosexual. And uh, another non-believer came to my defense and was going to beat the guy up. <laughs> so I'm standing there and I said, I don't need your help. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you know you wanting to help me out and everything, but I don't need your help. And uh, so the authorities came. They moved our our location to another place, but but this had caused a great stir, <laughs> uh, big crowd. And so the crowd actually followed um, followed me to where uh, I was going to to preach. And so they they stayed there through the message. And after the message, there was 
you know, people standing all around in groups talking to the Christians that were with us, and they were sharing the gospel. And I believe that that, that uh, ruckus opened the door for the gospel. And one guy said to me, he said, how do you do this? I mean, how do you come here and get rejected every day and have lemonade thrown on you? You know, how, how, does, how do you do this? And so, of course, it's by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit because I don't like people throwing lemonade on me. It's just la like last year when the guy cursed out my daughter and another girl. I didn't like that. I wanted to take action. You know, the world hates us because we're his disciples. That's part of being a disciple. Part of being a Christian is that the world, the world will hate us. That guy last year in San Francisco told us, told me that he wanted to take a baseball bat and crush all of our Christian heads. That's what he told me. He was this close to my face, cursing me out. You know, why do Christians want the name of Jesus, but they don't want to suffer for the name of Jesus? That's what the Bible says. If we live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will suffer. But Christians, we want a nice, happy life. No suffering, no rejection. Oh, if I share the gospel, this person might not like me. Well, it's, you know, that's nothing. That's nothing. If you can't handle that, how are you going to handle it when someone says, renounce your faith or die? Right? So, it's a serious thing to be a Christian. We've turned it into a formula where someone says a simple prayer, and presto, they're into the kingdom of God. No counting the cost, no repentance, you know. I mean, when a person becomes a believer, they should feel doomed before God. They should feel undone, that they deserve the God's judgment. Now, I realize that people become Christians at a young age and they probably don't feel doomed in that way. But I'll tell you, and I've watched this for many years as they get older and they come to realize what, uh, what their parents have taught them, they say, wow, this is serious business. And I've seen that happen on Mission Possible many times where they actually realized their faith. They made a profession as a, ch a child. They knew that they had sinned. They, that was the right thing. They, and I actually believe that children do feel doomed when they become Christians, but maybe not to the extent of someone who's had a bad, you know, a, a so-called bad life. You know, because he's forgiven much, loves much. And I think later in life, I've seen these teenagers realize that, wow, I haven't been taking my faith seriously. I've heard them over and over and over again testify to that truth on Mission Possible teams. Wow, I didn't really know what it was to follow Jesus. And I've even had uh, one or two, I think it was one, made it through the application process, gave a Christian testimony, everything, and that person realized on the trip that they were not a Christian. And they repented and they believed in Jesus on the trip and became a Christian. So what is a disciple? A disciple uh, is someone who believes the gospel and he starts in Jesus' way of life. A disciple is one who counts the cost of being a disciple. A disciple becomes like their teacher. Jesus said a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. You know, this is an amazing truth for us as Christians. 
And this is, we're going to get on the positive side here. Is that we are made like Jesus. Do you realize that in the fall, because of sin, we are not like we should be. We are not like we should be because of sin. Right? And sin has caused a barrier between us and God. And so no matter what we do to try to reach God, we run into this barrier of sin. And so people made in the image of God are not what they should be. Have you ever been to the fair and you've looked in one of those curvy mirrors? You know, you can still recognize who you are, but it's distorted. The image of you is distorted. We're made in the image of God, and there's still vestiges of that, I suppose, for lack of a better term, of that in us, we're still considered made in the image of God, yet it's been distorted by sin. And the Scripture promises that we're going to be like our teacher. Well, who is our teacher? The Lord Jesus Christ? He is the image of God and man perfectly seen. Right? Perfect, without sin. He is the perfect image of of God. We were made in the image of God. We fell. He is the image of God. And it says we're going to be made like our teacher. And so he came to the earth and he lived among us under the law, yet without sin. Right? And what was his purpose? For Christ died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, that he might what? Bring us to God. Right? He came to die for our sins and bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And so Jesus came. He overcame this world. He lived a a perfect life in the cross. They gave him a crown of thorns. But now he has a crown of glory because he is, he's conquered sin and, and death on behalf of man. and He sits at the right hand of the throne of God on high and he's, he's making us into his image. For those he foreknew, he ought... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. (laughs) We're going to become like Jesus perfectly. We're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We're not to be conformed to this world The world wants to take us and squeeze us into its mold, but we're to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And all those truths in Romans 8, 29-30 are in the past tense. He called us, He justified us, and He glorified us. They are going to be completed if we're true believers. They will be completed. He who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. And we all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Paul speaking of the glory of the new covenant over the fading glory of the old covenant. The glory faded off of Moses' face. But not in Jesus Christ. We're 
being transformed from one degree of glory to another into the perfect image of God. To the perfect image of God. Just as we bore the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. How does this happen? What does Jesus do? Well, he transforms us from glory to glory by us being obedient to his commands. We see our lives transformed and changed through sanctification. Yes, Jesus sees us perfectly as glorified, but yet we progressively grow as we go through the trials and tribulations of life. And a very big part of those trials and tribulations is suffering for the name of Jesus. The disciples rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Doing these devotions and acts with the teenagers, what a blessing that is. It's an action book. And we're on mission with God. And watching over and over again persecution and how the disciples persevered. And then cross-referencing those persecutions to what Paul said about those persecutions. That he was beaten with rods, stoned, all those things. That's the testimony of the book of Acts. Of a real Christian life. Right? Right? And so we're sanctified by being rejected for his name, by suffering for his name, by going through the regular trials and tribulations of life also, but for suffering for his name. I know the Lord's working on my character as I go out and preach, and sometimes I don't do the perfect thing, you know? I don't do the right thing, and I have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me grow in this area of my life. Have any of you been there? I'm struggling, Lord. It seems like I keep confessing the same sin over and over again. I need to be obedient to You and stop this. Give me the strength to do that. And so, we're sanctified by following His example of suffering. So, disciples... become disciples when they believe. Disciples count the cost. Disciples become like their teacher, and disciples continue in the faith. Right? They went out from us because they were not of us. If you read the book of Revelation over and over and over and over again, you'll see those that endured to the end We're basically the true Christians. Now, does this mean we lose our salvation? Absolutely not. It just means that there's false believers in the church. And when put to the test, the false believers scatter. The cares of this world, persecution, these kinds of things cause Christians to show their true colors. Their true colors. Disciples are, are the disciples love the brethren and are known by that love. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the wonderful thing about going out in a team and doing ministry together with people is that people get to see the love of Christ on display. A lot of people aren't going to come through these doors. Okay? We have to go to them. I remember going down to Langley Park with Mission Possible, and Don and Mary Ellen Stover coming out, and they flipped hamburgers in the Latino community there. And they showed the love of Christ in their lives. Just by being there, helping with the mission. Right? 
And we had some friends from the Latino churches come, and they preached, and we did puppets, and we were all working together as a team. And so the love of Christ was put on display there. Old people, teenagers, middle-aged guy, people from different cultures, all working together for the mission of Christ. That was so beautiful this summer. We had Americans, Mexicans, and Costa, and Costa Ricans, and Guatemalans, depending on where we were, working together for the same uh, goal of making Christ known to people. And so people would see our team, and it was multi-ethnic, different ages of people, out on the street, displaying the beauty of Christ, the love of Christ that we had for one another um, is a great witness. Now, hopefully if people do come through these doors, they'll see that, but most of the time we got to go to them. And I'm hoping that our action plan that's coming says let's hit the streets. Let's go down here to Harlequin Terrace and let's go to Langley Park, let's go to Silver Spring, let's go to all these areas and let's represent Christ. See how we can do love and good deeds for people, but always with the intention of preaching the gospel. Right? Disciples love the brethren and are known by their love. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. She loved people. Charity. She did good works. She ministered to widows. She put on display the gospel to widows. And when she died, Peter came and raised her from the dead, and that was another platform for preaching the gospel. Everything that's done in the book of Acts, and the teenagers made these observations. They said, I notice every time that they preach the word of God. Every time. And you know, I love that missions gets involved in relief work. I love that, we, that there are mission trips to, to save sex slaves. I love all these things. They are great and good things. And they actually open the door for the gospel. But if they're done to the exclusion of the proclamation of the gospel, then we've lost our mission. We've lost our mission if we do that. We believe at 4C that the purpose of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ worldwide through preaching the gospel, edifying believers, and equipping them for ministry. That's one of our articles of faith. We better never lose that purpose. And that coincides, by the way, with uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And I'm going to finish up here. I could talk all day on this. But we're told in Matthew 28, what? The main verb, or the controlling verb, is to make disciples. That's right. And there's three participles that go along with it, right? To go. Well, going can look a lot of different ways. You can go into Harlequin Terrace. You can go to your next door neighbor. You can go to that person in the next cubicle, right? You can go across the sea, but go, okay? Go out these doors. I, I saw one church, they had above their doors, you are now entering the mission field. I like that. Go. So go, what? Baptizing. Now, we know that baptism does not uh, save you, but it's a public identification with Jesus Christ that you belong to him. Really, when, when I read the book of Acts, people are getting baptized when they believe 
We're not going to get legalistic about this, but it's kind of like an initiation into discipleship, I suppose. I don't know. When you believe, you become a disciple. And you publicly proclaim that. Baptism doesn't save you. I'm not saying that. You publicly proclaim that to people in the congregation. And also teaching. So we teaching them to obey all things, not just some things, that Jesus taught. Right? How did Jesus do this? He modeled it for us. He called disciples. He said, come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. Right? He showed them what it was like to be in perfect obedience to the Father. We're supposed to be in obedience to Jesus Christ, right? He showed us what that submission is like. He showed us what it was like to serve people and to preach the gospel. He did that for his 12. Then, he put on training wheels and he said, you're going to go out and preach. And so they went out and they came back and some said, even the demons are subject to us. Some said they couldn't cast out demons. You know, but yet they experienced the ministry. And then in John 17, you see Jesus praying for his disciples. He recounts basically his whole ministry in that prayer. That he revealed the Father's name to the ones that were given to him. Right? And he says, Lord, as, as you have sent me into the world, I send them. It's a, it's a prayer of commission. They've walked with him. They've learned from him. He's about to die. And he's commissioning them to the ministry. And then he says, I don't only pray for them, but I pray for those who are going to believe through them. And so generation to generation, people have been grabbing the baton and running the next leg of the race. Representing Christ in this world. Are you running that race this morning? Are you part of what God has called us to do in discipling the nations? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for your example, Lord Jesus. And how you save people. You were obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. And you call us to do, be the same way. To have the same mind set. To follow you in the same way. Help us to be disciples, Lord. And help us to make disciples. This is what your word calls us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Believer in Jesus, you are a disciple.